Hi everyone! This is going to be lesson two all about plate tectonics. So this is going to cover chapter number two in your textbook and it's roughly pages 32 to 65. Now there will be just a little bit of overlap between lesson one and lesson two. It's all good. Um, the information is something that's really necessary and valuable. So if there's a little bit of overlap or we repeat anything, don't worry about it. All right, let's go ahead and dive right on in. So first we're gonna talk about the origins of the Earth. Now, most researchers believe that Earth and the other planets formed at essentially the exact same time from the same primordial material as the sun. So this is what we refer, refer to as the nebular hypothesis. Now within that hypothesis, there are about six or so different steps or important aspects to it. So number one is that the solar system actually evolved from enormous rotating cloud. That cloud was called the solar nebula. Now, that nebula was composed mostly of hydrogen and helium. Then sometime about 5 billion years ago, the nebula began to contract. Now, once it started to contract, it made a flat disk-like shape of cloud, and it actually had a proto-sun or a pre-sun that was in the middle of it. Now, the inner planets began to form from rocky metallic clumps of substances with really high melting points, while the outer planets actually began forming from fragments with a high percentage of ice, um, water, carbon dioxide, ammonia, and even methane. Now, the formation of Earth's layered structure, because we know that Earth has a different layered structure in it, as Earth was forming the decay of radioactive elements and heat from high velocity impacts caused the temperature of the earth to increase. So as it was increasing, the iron and nickel would begin to melt and it sunk towards the center. Now lighter rocky components would actually float outwards towards the surface. Then we even had a gaseous material that escaped the earth's interior and that produced our primitive atmosphere. So at some point or another, most of us have probably been involved at looking at um, layered liquids. So I'm going to pull up an image of some layered liquids right now. Um, this is an image just I have up here on Google. And so you can see that based off of all these different liquids that you can layer from honey up to lamp oil, you're going to get very distinct divisions. And this is all based off the density. So if we were to compare this to Earth's layered structure, down here the denser, heavier liquids is going to be where the iron and nickel core would be. While these lighter ones, the lamp oil, milk, and everything up here, those are going to be the lighter, rocky elements that we would have. Alright, let's jump back into our PowerPoint. Now I've included two videos here about how the earth was made. The first one is a great one that was put on by the History Channel. It is in total about a 50 minute show, but the first 11 and a half minutes really covers how the earth was made. The entire thing is great, but if you're on a time crunch, just focus on that first part. There's also an additional short little animation and that will go through the origin of the solar system. Feel free to watch those on your own time after this. Alright, so let's test our knowledge. So Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. If all the planets in our solar system formed at about the same time, how old would you expect Mars to be? Any thoughts? Probably about the same amount of time, right? Same with Jupiter. Same with anything else that would be considered forming in our solar system. So it's going to be roughly 4.6 billion years old. Now it can be a little more, a little less, just kind of depends. Now I do know that my image I included is a little out of date. It has Pluto on there, but I'm old school. Pluto is always going to be a planet to me. All right, so moving on, let's talk about Earth's internal structure. So we have a layered Earth system, and it can be divided up two different ways. 
First, we are gonna talk about composition. So we'll start with the crust. The crust is a thin, rocky outer skin to the earth. Now this is subdivided into two divisions. We have oceanic and continental crust. So oceanic crust is just like what it sounds, typical of oceans. Roughly, it is seven to five kilometers thick in most areas. It will be composed of a dark igneous rock that we call basalt. So that's gonna be in your igneous rock bag. So if you wanna check that out, it'll be in there. And this is anywhere between 180 million years old to modern day. So this is a lot younger and roughly the density is three grams per cubic centimeter. So this is gonna be the denser of the two types of crust. Next, we have continental crust. So it averages between 35 and 40 kilometers, so 25 miles thick. The composition consists of a lot of different rock types and it is 4.4 4 billion years old or less and it is less dense at about 2.7 grams per centimeters cubed. All right, so I'm gonna grab me a drink of water real quick and then we'll talk about the mantle. So the next one we're talking about composition would come the mantle. So this is over 82% of all of Earth's total volume. It's solid and it has a rocky shell it extends to a depth of about 1,800 miles. The dominant rock in the uppermost part of the mantle is what we call peridotite. Next, we'll have the core. So it's thought to be composed of iron nickel alloy with minor amounts of oxygen, silicon, and sulfur. Due to extreme pressure found in the core, the density is nearly 11 grams per centimeter. All right, so Earth's internal structure defined by physical properties. So we went from being defined by the composition to the actual physical properties of it. Now this diagram gives you a really good idea of what we'll be talking about. So temperature, pressure, and density will gradually increase with depth into the Earth's interior surface. So on average for about every 70 feet that you go down inside the earth, the temperature is gonna increase roughly one degree Fahrenheit. So the further you get down towards the core, the warmer it's going to be. That is what we refer to as the geothermal gradient. Now we get changes in temperature and pressure that affect the physical properties, and hence that affects the mechanical behavior of the earth's materials. And we are going to have five main layers of earth based off of the physical properties and the mechanical strength. All right, so our first one is gonna be the lithosphere. So this consists of the crust and the uppermost part of the mantle. It's relatively cool, rigid shell, and it can be on average about 100 kilometers thick, but in some areas, maybe all the way up to 250 kilometers. Now within the ocean basins, it can only be a few kilometers thick. So it really does vary based off of where you are. So if you're in the ocean, it's gonna be less thick versus if you're under an old mountain range. All right, so in the next physical property layer will be the asthenosphere. So this is right beneath the lithosphere in the upper mantle. So there will be melting in the top part of this layer. And the lithosphere is mechanically detached and is able to move independently of the asthenosphere. All right, so next we have the mesosphere or the lower mantle, and this is between 660 and 2,900 um, 2, kilometers thick. So not a lot of information that we really need to know about the mesosphere. Next, we have the core. So we have the outer core, which is the liquid layer, and we have convective flow of the metallic iron-rich metals that generate the Earth's magnetic field. Next, we're gonna have the inner core. This is strong due to the high pressures, and this is the solid layer. 
All right, so this is a really great comparison of the chemical to physical or the mechanical structures of the earth. So notice with the compositional layers, we have three layers, whereas the mechanical layers, you're gonna get five. All right, so we're gonna move on to continental drift. This was really a theory before its time. When I talk about continental drift, unfortunately, I'm not talking about the movie, but I'm talking about the idea that was first proposed by Alfred Wegener back in 1915. So he published a book that was called The Origins of the Continents and Oceans. So Wagner's continental drift hypothesis was essentially that there was a supercontinent called Pangaea that began breaking apart about 200 million years ago. Now, if you wanna watch a short animation right down here, it will go through and show you how there was one big continent, the supercontinent, and how it is broken up. Now, the overall summary is that the continents drifted into their present positions and the continents broke through the ocean crest. The main objection to Wagner's um, proposal was that it was unable to provide a mechanism for the continents actually moving and separating apart. All right, so we're going to talk about some of the different evidence that Wagner used when he was talking about continental drift. So the first one he used is probably one of the most compelling and that we're most familiar with, and that would be the fit of South America and Africa together. So let me grab my pen. Um, and that's going to be what we're showing down here in this image. As you can see, these fit together really incredibly. Now there can be just a little bit of separation and some people use that to say that they don't fit together. But when you look at the continental shelf, so not just the land that's above the ocean, but this oceanic shelf, which is this light blue color right here, these fit together really well. Now, one of the other types of evidence he used was fossil matches across the different types of seas. So that's gonna be this image right up here. So you can see that in some areas like South America, you're gonna get this fossil that goes from South America into Africa, and you'll even get some that will span like this fossil of a fern that goes from Australia to Antarctica, India, Africa, all the way to South America. Now, we also get different types of rock types and structure matches, so that's gonna be in this one down here. So you can see that on the eastern coast of North America, we have the same types of rocks, same types of structures that you would see up on Greenland and that you also see over here in Africa and some of these island areas out through here. Now lastly, he used ancient climates. And so that's what we see over here in this image. For more information on that, please check out your textbook. All right, so the theory of plate tectonics. This is a lot more encompassing than just the theory of continental drift. So the theory called plate tectonics has now emerged that provides geologists with the first comprehensive model of Earth's internal workings. So we have Earth's rigid outer shell, which is the lithosphere. It's divided into numerous slabs that are called plates. So there's seven or eight major plates, but within that there's probably a dozen or so smaller ones. Now we have the lithospheric plates that are moving relative to each other at a very slow but continuous rate that is gonna average about two inches a year. So these grinding movements of the plates can generate earthquakes, create volcanoes, and deform large masses of rock into mountains. So we'll actually get a chance to talk about each one of these in their own separate chapters. Now, talking about how fast and how slow plates are moving, the absolute slowest one is going to move somewhere between one and four centimeters a year. 
that's roughly the rate that your fingernails will grow. Now the fastest is about 16 centimeters a year and that's the quickness that your hair actually grows out. All right, so these are the different types of plates um, that we have and we have, we are up here right here or so um, in the middle of the North American plate and you can see that there's some larger plates but there's also some smaller ones in there as well. Now um, talking about plates and their plate boundaries, all major interactions among individual plates are gonna occur at their boundaries so that's where they're actually intersecting. So new plate boundaries are created in response to changes and the forces acting in the lithosphere or on the lithosphere. So as long as Earth's internal heat engine is operating, the positions and shapes of the continents and oceans will always change. So there's three short or there's three types of plate boundaries um, and these images and clips down here show you those different types of plate boundaries and the movement that you would expect on each of them. All right, so first talking about divergent plate boundaries. So two plates are gonna be moving apart. So if they're constantly being pulled apart, moving apart, and this is resulting in upwelling of material from the mantle to create new seafloor. So this is what we refer to as seafloor spreading. So these are what we refer to and call constructive margins because new material is being created. It's constructing more. Now along divergent boundaries, the oceanic lithosphere is elevated and forms a ridge because it's hot and occupies more volume than the cooler rocks. This represents about 20% of all of Earth's surface. We have rift valleys that may develop along the axis and typically these are spreading at five to nine centimeters a year. Now continental rifts form at spreading centers within a continent. All right. So this is an image that is showing some of our different types of plate boundaries that we have. So first is the divergent plate boundary. So we have two different kinds. We have oceanic rifting or seafloor spreading. And you can see that magma is actually coming up. The asthenosphere is melting. It's pushing through the lithosphere and it's creating this new seafloor. Now, this section up here is higher than it is out here. So once it becomes cool and dense, it actually starts to sink. Whereas when it's warm and hot, it is much more buoyant. So this is where the ocean is getting pulled apart. Now over here with continental rifting, that is gonna happen on the continents. So a great example of this is over on the East African Rift Valley. So again, we have some upwelling. Um, as it starts to upwell, it will come up, it will bust through, and it causes upwarping. Now, as this gets pulled apart, we can create these little lakes down in here. We'll eventually produce what's called a linear C. It will give way until we'll eventually end up with oceanic crust where we have water. So essentially right now, Africa is being ripped apart where the East African Rift Valley is and we are experiencing continental rifting there. Now convergent plate boundaries are where plates collide um, an, ocean, an ocean trench forms and the lithosphere is subducted into the mantle. So this is gonna be destructive. So when the two collide, only one typically survives and there's gonna be three types of convergence that we're gonna talk about. So we have oceanic continental convergence. So this is where we have an oceanic plate that is converging with a continental plate. So the denser oceanic slab sinks into the asthenosphere. We will have pockets of magma that develop and rise, and then we'll get continental volcanic arcs that form. 
So examples of where this is happening is the Andes, the Cascades, and the Sierra Nevada system. So down here on the image, you'll see the oceanic plate. It's subducting underneath this continental crust. It's subducting because it's denser. So again, this is going to have a density of about 3, and this is a density of about 2.7 or so. So as it's subducting, it melts down here. The melting will break through, and that's why we get some of those different volcanic arcs. Now the next type of convergence is going to be our oceanic, oceanic convergence, where we have two oceanic slabs converge and one descends beneath the other. So this often forms volcanoes on our ocean floor. So volcanic island arcs form as volcanoes emerging up from the sea. So this is the Aleutian, the Mariana, and the Tonga Islands. So again, one oceanic, another one is actually being subducted. We have melting again as it's coming through. That is what's creating our volcanoes. Now our next type is going to be continental continental convergence. So when subducting plates contain continental material, two continents collide, they can produce new mountain ranges such as the Himalayas. Um, so that's what we see right over here. Again, we have one continental plate going underneath another one. Um, and as it's going down, some of this material is actually getting pushed up. So instead of forming something like our volcanoes, we're forming more of mountains. All right, so next we have what we call transform plate boundaries. So these are where plates just slide past one another. No new crust is created, none is destroyed. So this is consistent with transform faults. Um, one of the largest ones that we have is going to be the San Andreas Fault. Um, and these are most common in the oceanic floor. So this is where we have most are joining two segments of a mid-ocean ridge system. So at the time they form, they're roughly parallel to the direction that the plate is moving. So this aids in the movement of the oceanic crustal material. All right, so test your knowledge. Explain why plates such as the African and Antarctic plates are getting larger, why the Pacific plate is getting smaller. So our African plate is gonna be right here. The Antarctic plate is down here. And the Pacific plate is right here. Now, when you think about these, think about the type of plates that are all around it. What type of boundaries do we have? Now, in the Pacific, most of this is going to be rimmed. So this is our Pacific plate over here as well. And all over here, we have convergent plate boundaries. So this is actually getting pushed down and underneath these other plates. So it is getting destroyed. Whereas right along through here, along our African plate and along our Antarctic plate, we actually have new seafloor spreading. So it's actually getting larger. All right, so talking about evidence of plate tectonics. So paleomagnetism is a great set of evidence. So this is probably the most persuasive evidence that there is for it. Um, ancient magnetism pr is preserved in the rocks. So paleomagnetic records show that there's polar wandering, so evidence that continents moved. It shows Earth's magnetic field reversals. It's recorded in the rocks as they form on the oceanic ridges, and it's recorded reversals across oceanic ridges that confirm that the seafloor is actually spreading. So as magma is coming up through here, it is aligning with the poles. So that's what we have in our red one. So let's say that it is normal magnetic polarity. So our magnetic pole is pointing to the north. But at some point in the past, there was a reversal. So as the magma was coming out, 
it actually recorded something quite different. And so as it's coming out, it's getting cooler, denser, it's moving out this direction, and this way uh, from our seafloor spreading, we're gonna have different types of reversals and normal magnetism that's shown in the rocks. All right, next is gonna be um, the pattern of earthquakes and deep sea drilling. So earthquake patterns, these are gonna be associated with our plate boundaries. So deep focus, so earthquakes that happen deep within the earth along trenches provide a method for tracking a plate's descent. So this short video down here, check it out. It explores features of plate boundaries and the evidence geologists use for plate tectonics. And then there's also oceanic drilling. So the deep sea drilling project, um, Gollumers Challenge. So the age of the deepest sediments in the ocean um, were found. The youngest are typically near the ridges, so that's the higher points, while the older are at a distance from the ridge. So ocean basins are geologically young. All right, so next we're going to talk about evidence of plate tectonics using a hot spot tracking. So hot spots are rising plumes of mantle material. So volcanoes can form over them, so that's what our Hawaiian islands are. And um, so as the chains of the volcanoes mark the plate movement. So down here is a short animation that shows you how these are forming. So we have this hot spot that's coming up right through here. It's creating all of our islands. And you can see the ages. So the oldest island here is this one up here, Kauai. It's 3.8 to 5.6 million years old. While down here, Hawaii, the big island is the youngest and it's about 0.7 to present in age. So as the magma is coming up under that one spot, the hot spot's not moving but the plate is moving out across it, and that is what's giving you the direction of our plate moving. All right, so one of the mechanisms for plate motion, no one model can actually explain all the different faucets of the plate tectonics. Um, the Earth's heat is the main driving force for it. So there's several models that have been proposed. There's slab pull and slab push, and there's the plate mantle convection. Um, not saying either one is right or wrong. I tend to go more on this. Um, and there's a little bit of an animation down here if you wanna learn more about plate motion. All right, so our next steps and additional information, make sure you complete lab two, plate tectonics complete your reading quiz. If you want some additional optional material, check out the homework um, that is on Mastering Geology and the study module. And if you need anything else, you can also check out the Geode Essentials of Geology lecture material. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to let me know. Thank you.